Hello, and thank you for joining us for Tuesday Bible Time. Uh, we are glad that you are here this evening. Uh, looks a little bit different. Usually we're in front of the TV on Tuesday evenings, but uh, it is going to be a little bit different this evening, and I will get to that in just a little bit. Uh, but first of all, uh, you know, we never know if uh, someone is joining us for the first time uh, or if this is your 53rd time. Uh, but uh, we like to let people know who we are, who are these people. And so uh, we are Bible Doctrines to Live By. We are located here in Comstock Park, Michigan. And some of the things we do are that we have Bible study materials, uh, gospel tracts, uh, we have lessons, uh, curriculum. Um, so we have all of that. Uh, you know, even right now as I'm speaking this, uh, they're on a... They're doing a kind of a traveling conference, and so we do, um, uh, we do conferences and Bible schools, and uh, we have a website, which I will show you right now, there it is, at BibleDoctrines.org, where we have a store where you can see what curriculum and books and tracts that we have. There are uh, audio lessons, all of these videos are there that you can watch. Um, all sorts of resources, plus there's links to other uh, grace organizations that have their uh, materials as well. But So I encourage you to check out our website, uh, not, too, uh, not too hard to remember. But also if you have any questions uh, or would like to order something, uh, 616-785-3618. And of course we have a, an email. Um, staff at BibleDoctrines.org. So there is that. Besides this Tuesday morning, or Tuesday morning, Tuesday evening broadcast, uh, we have one on Sunday evenings at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and evangelist Joel McGarvey has been back in the studio and uh, has picked up that. And so... Um, uh, that is 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for the Bible Study Hour. Also, each morning on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, beginning at 9.30 for about oh, 20 minutes or so, uh, we meet. We do not provide the cop coffee. However, we do. We can provide the Bible Doctrines to Live By mugs right there, available for us. Uh, you can call us for those or order them on our website, I think. Uh, probably better to call us. Anyway, uh, but... You have to provide your own coffee, but uh, we meet for a time of, of Scripture. Most of the time we call it a devotional, uh, and then we share requests that the body of Christ can uh, lift up together before the Lord. So that is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, that one is only Facebook. Uh, the uh, Bible study hour, this one, and uh, Sunday nights are also available on YouTube, uh, but... Uh, and later we'll be on our website. So there's all of that that we do. Uh, another thing, because because what I'm going to do is um, Sunday, uh, I've been going through the Book of Romans, and uh, they're on the website. You can you can listen to them. But in between each chapter, I like to take a break, do something a little bit different uh, for my sake and the congregation's sake. And we talked about Zacchaeus, and I, I enjoyed that. And so that's what you're going to be seeing here in a few moments. And because I'm going to let my closing prayer uh, from Sunday be our closing prayer for this evening, uh, I also want to let you know that, um, you know, if you're watching this and uh, you're not sure about this whole church thing and God thing and, and how to be saved, or maybe you do go to church uh, and yet you've been told uh, going to that church saves you or whatever, and uh, tonight is the night you realize it's just by faith fully in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We have some things that we would like uh, to, to have available for you. So if you want to put that uh, up the screen there uh, with the contact information, there's a Bible, there's some booklets we want to send to you. And uh, there's our address, Bible Doctrines to Live By. And uh, we have a post office, P.O. Box 564. Comstock Park, Michigan, 49321. I'm going to say that again because I know I need things repeated. Bible Doctrines to Live By, P.O. Box 564, Comstock Park, Michigan, 
49321. And of course, our phone number, once again, 616-785-3618. Okay, so uh, that's what I have for you. That's a little taste of uh, who we are as Bible Doctrines to Live By. And once again, I encourage you to visit our website with uh, so much, so many resources, uh, also a store. Um, and uh, well, right now, uh, I'm not going to yap anymore. Well, I am going to, but uh, I'm not going to. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about Zacchaeus uh, and uh, learn a little bit more about him, uh, and, but also um, learn about a lesson that we can learn from the account of Zacchaeus. So uh, without any further delay, I take you to Croton Community Church in Croton, Michigan uh, for a sermon on Zacchaeus. Thanks. So you can take your Bibles and uh, practice turning to Luke chapter 19. Uh, and uh, since I want to keep her engaged, I'm going to talk about Miriam. Um, because I asked Miriam what she wanted me to talk about. And she said, I also have to apologize for, first of all, for mentioning her, but uh, that'll be later. But when I asked her what she wanted to talk about, she said Zachariah. Zach Zacchaeus. I can't even remember the guy's name. And then she said Noah. But... Okay, but Zacchaeus just, just stuck with me. So that's what we're going to talk about today, Zacchaeus. And uh, many of you know about Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man, a wee little man with tea. Uh, he climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Lord he wanted to see. What, you, you know the song, right? I almost sang it, but we didn't have a CD for it. So um, maybe we can make that happen. But it's, it's one thing to know the basics and then to dig in deep. Uh, and see really, not really what happened, but, but just the depth of what Christ, and what happened to Zacchaeus that day. And even how it ties into what Jesus had said prior. We're going to look at some of those things. Uh, because whether it's today in the age of grace, or whether it's, you know, what Jesus was proclaiming here in, in the gospel of the kingdom, that Savior is that there's only one. And that was Jesus Christ. And so Zacchaeus, if he wanted to have eternal life and forgiveness, he had to go to Christ. Uh, us, today in the age of grace, if we want forgiveness and all of those things, we're not told to, to, to make, uh, uh, make restitution and all those things. We're told forgiveness is available through Jesus Christ. But it still comes down to that statement, what a wonderful Savior. And so we're going to look at uh, Zacchaeus. Uh, for a little bit. Uh, I get to talk about my dad for a little bit, but I'm sure there'll be all sorts of things I didn't plan uh, that will come up, because that's just what happens. But uh, before we do any reading and uh, talking about Zacchaeus, uh, let's have a word of prayer. God and Father, thank you for this opportunity that I have. Um, I guess sometimes we don't stop enough and just reflect on the fact that life in you is an opportunity. There are so many living life on their own. And yet still you plead for them. Come to me so I can give you true everlasting life. And that only comes through that, that wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we recognize the, the dispensational context. That's not our focus today. And Yet there's a lesson here, Father, that, um, that we can learn. Uh, and so I just pray that this account of Zacchaeus, while we learn more of the facts around it, may you use it on our hearts to humble ourselves before you. And that as I say amen in the closing prayer today, Father, that song that we sung, What a Wonderful Savior, will, will have that much more meaning to us. I pray all these things in the name of that wonderful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so Luke chapter 19. And I'm going to go ahead and just, I'm not going to read through it all. We'll just, I mean, you can read it if you want to, but uh, I mean, so, let me restate it. I am going to read through it all, but not all at one time. I'm going to kind of take it and uh, say a few things, and we'll work our way through it, all right? Luke chapter 19, um, in Luke 
Luke's account, at least, this comes after uh, they were already around Jericho. There was a blind man there, and uh, Jesus gave him sight. Uh, and um, after he received his sight, this formerly blind man was following Jesus around and praising God uh, for, uh, for what had been done to him, what had been done for him. And uh, the other people around Jericho heard this, and uh, they began to glorify God. Uh, verse 43 at the end, all the people, when they saw, when they saw that this blind man was healed, gave praise unto God. So word is getting out in the city. And uh, they, they apparently they, they all knew this man, uh, and, uh, and they knew that he was blind, uh, and now that he could see, they're, oh, praise God, what, something special happened here. And so word is getting out, and of course, the one of the people that heard this news was Zacchaeus. And so Zacchaeus heard this news, and he wanted to see this Jesus Christ. All right, so that's our context coming into chapter 19 and verse, let, let me read the first two verses. After this healing of the blind man, it says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. So, let's talk about Jericho for a little bit, for a moment. Uh, probably as far as, uh, when it comes to us Bible scholars, uh, when Jericho comes up, the reason we remember it is because of Joshua, Right? Joshua, when they crossed the Jordan River, Jericho was the first city there, uh, and they walked around the city, all those things, and the walls fell down. They went into the city and captured it. Um, so that's how we are kind of know Jericho from the scriptures, but, uh, but Herod had rebuilt uh, this, this city of, of, that was, well, that was Jericho, uh, and uh, he had a, uh, a winter home there. Uh, that he could go and find a vacation. And, and uh, from what I understand, Jericho was kind of a city for the, uh, well, for the rich. Um, it, was, it was fertile uh, because it was right by the, the uh, Jordan River and had uh, irrigation. Uh, so it had plenty of crops. Uh, it was for the affluent. Uh, so the, well, it had all the, the rich people had a home there. Uh, and that was... Jericho. Uh, also, uh, what tended to happen is because it was known that there was money in Jericho, those who were less fortunate would, that's where they would stand because they knew there were people there that had the means to help them, and so they would beg for help out at Jericho. And so that's kind of uh, some information about Jericho during Jesus' time. Uh, and then we have Zacchaeus. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Jericho, when you think of uh, uh, Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is the center of Israel, well, not the literal geographical center, but uh, the prophetic and eternal, eternal center, uh, Jericho is about 15 miles northeast of, of Jerusalem. And so, not too far, all right, from, from Jerusalem. Um, anywho, getting to Zacchaeus, um, there in that region where the blind man was healed and where Jesus entered in and, uh, uh, and ministered, uh, we have Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector there in the region of Jericho. And not only was he a, a tax collector, he was the chief tax collector, which means he was the master. Now, um, I can imagine that um, many of us don't uh, don't have too fond thoughts whenever I mention like the IRS. I mean, none of us say things like "Woohoo! It's tax time!" Yes. All right, this should be a holiday. Yeah. Uh, but uh, most of us don't like that uh, paying taxes. It, I guess, it comes with the whole grumbling and complaining kind of thing. Uh, I think I've shared this with you before, but when I was young, my dad was a tax collector uh, for the for the, the township. Uh, Pennsylvania, they had townships, but anyway. 
Um, and so most people just mailed their taxes in. So around tax season, we get all sorts of mail. Uh, for me, as a young kid, it was kind of junk mail because I had to tax stuff. Um, I can still remember the slips that he had to mail out. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure they were the car on the carbon paper and all that. Uh, but anyway, some people who were in the area, they would come and visit. Uh, not visit, hey, let's go visit our tax collector. No, but they would come and pay their taxes in person. And my dad has, had his own desk there. And uh, we weren't really, when he was doing that, we weren't really supposed to be running around, all right, uh, in the room. But, I hope dad doesn't watch this, but there were times that when someone came in, I would listen at the door. I mean, it was boring. I can't even tell you what they talked about. I mean, the guy's sitting there talking about, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, yeah, they had knee replacement. Hey, what's that? Um, and, uh, or maybe complaining, man, taxes really went up this year. Dad, yeah, you know, it's a shame or whatever. Uh, but anyway, um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people knew my dad in that uh, area. And really, when it, I'm glad when it came to that, him doing that, um, people never blamed him, uh, you know, for the things. They, they liked him and our house was never egged or anything like that. Actually, I, I think when my dad stepped down, my aunt, I think, is now the tax collector. So we like have a monopoly. Uh, the Ritchie family, we just, we own that place, uh, the tax collector. Anyway, um, however, I want to go back to your experience with the IRS. My apologies if anybody here ever worked for the IRS. The thing is, is that we tend to stereotype uh, and I'm sure at least some of them are, are nice people. You know, I'm sure they're just, they like numbers and all those things. But um, just like my dad, I can tell you, my dad had nothing to do with how many tax, how much taxes uh, people paid. Um, he just is responsible for collecting them. However, let's talk a little bit about here, uh, this publican Zacchaeus. Um, actually, the name Zacchaeus, it's kind of funny because his name means pure and innocent. Zacchaeus was not, um, and so uh, he wasn't living up to his name, I guess. But to be a tax collector at this time, it's kind of like they had tryouts. And um, in order to stand out, you had to show your ability to collect funds. And so obviously the more funds you collect, the better you do. So as you can imagine, this encouraged cheating and high taxes and all of those things. Uh, and, and then to have Zacchaeus called here the chief publican. Uh, not, a, not a trainee, uh, but the chief publican. Uh, you can kind of imagine how he got into that position. Uh, Rome was not known for uh, taking it easy as far as taxes are concerned. Uh, the taxes were pretty much excessive. Uh, it was a heavy tax burden that the people of Rome had to, to, uh, to, to bear. Uh, and not only that, but the, the publicans or the tax collectors had a very deserved reputation for maybe adding a few percentage points that they would keep for themselves. And so when it, was, when it says here he was rich, that doesn't mean because he, just because he got a promotion, uh, but some of that richness came from cheating people out of their, their money. Um, not only, uh, and, and we can't just look at tax collectors as, as all they're really IRS, boo, all right? Uh, because as a, as a Jew, as a tax collector, you were also a traitor to the nation because you were working for Rome. Right, so all of these things go into this statement. Zacchaeus was chief among the publicans, and he was rich. He was, a, he was looked at as a traitor, as a cheat. All right? Uh, and and uh, not just he was doing a job no one liked. Uh, and so that's Zacchaeus. I want to, uh, actually don't turn there. You can turn it. Write this down and look at it later. But in Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, this is, this is neat. Listen to this. Um, Jesus is training his disciples. 
All right? He's, he's, he's instructing them. And then here's what he says. All right? If they do not, if you go into a place and they do not listen to you, all right? Listen to this. Treat them like the heathen or tax collectors. Jesus was tying the tax collectors to heathen. The reason is because they, they were. Uh, they were not nice people at this time. They couldn't be, or else they wouldn't be in that position. Um, and uh, I just found it very telling, at least for me, that Jesus is saying, disciples, you treat them like heathen, which were people cast off, as far cast off as you can, or like tax collectors. And he's really equating tax collectors with the heathen. Not only that, but, it, but Jesus, in saying that, uh, was addressing how they were being treated. Uh, if you were a Jew or if you were a Roman citizen, really, but especially if you were a, a Jew, uh, you wanted to have, they were the worst of the worst. They were lower than the, the scum on the bottom of your shoe. That's how they were treated. They weren't invited to parties. Uh, you didn't, if they, if they uh, tried to talk to you, you went the other way. All right. Uh, they were on the totem, society's totem pole. They were not even on the list. They were, you have your own list uh, of anathema. Uh, that's how they were looked upon. And that's who the story is focused on in these 10 verses of Luke chapter 19. This chief publican. Uh, I already mentioned he was, he was rich. So, which is another reason why, uh, why he would be looked down upon. Uh, not only because of his social status, uh, and the, the way he uh, got that social status is, again, by betraying his people, turning to Rome, uh, but also people knew, people knew that they, they were uh, uh, adding, adding a few percentage points to, to line their own pockets, and what could you do? You had to pay for it. Um, and so uh, that's what we have here. Zacchaeus, a tax collector, uh, and rich. But notice with verse 3, let's keep going. And he, that's Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus, who he was, and couldn't for the press, because he was little of stature. So, uh, once again, it was God getting out in the city that Jesus, he held, he they give us the blind man's name, a uh, beggar. Um, he was a son of David, that's all I know. So this beggar that he that he now can see, Zacchaeus heard it, and like, who is this guy? I, I have to see him. And uh, notice that, uh, well, there was a crowd. Um, this wasn't just a few people that lined the streets. This place was, was the streets were packed with people looking to see Jesus. I mean, more packed than probably any parade that you have ever gone to. I mean, we're probably talking Macy's Day parade-sized crowds. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe I'm being overly dramatic. But there were a lot of people there, right? in other words. Okay? The unfortunate thing for Zacchaeus is, I guess he arrived late, and uh, he, was, he was a small guy. Um, and so all of these tall people are in front of him, and guess what? He couldn't see. All right? But listen. Here's what I want you to see from verse 3, is that Zacchaeus actually got out of his house, uh, he went to see Jesus, and he sought him out. He could have easily said, oh man, I can't see, or I don't, I don't, um, uh, you know, the crowd, uh, I can't see him anyway. Oh well, I'll go home and count my money again. He doesn't do that. He had this desire to see Jesus, and he counted him worth seeing. I don't know what his intentions were. The, the scripture doesn't say. But to me, it has to be more than a curiosity thing. Because, um, because he persists. Uh, you know, he doesn't just stand behind the crowd. Oh, maybe I can see his, you know, his hair as I get by here. Now, he wants to see him. He wants to lay eyes on him. He wants to, to look at him and see who he is. He's persistent. Verse 4, he goes on and he says, And he ran before, and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for Jesus was to pass that way. Now, 
I, I, I know this was not a, uh, you know, I, I mentioned Macy's Day Parade, or any parade that you go to, there is a, there is a plan, pre-planned parade route, correct? I mean, here when they have the parade around um, July 4th here in, in Croton, there's a pre-planned parade route, pre-planned parade route, all right? They don't just say, hmm, where do we want to go this year? Let's go this way. Oh, okay. They're not in the parade and say, hey, let's go left. Uh, you know, let's go by the, uh, the mall's house down from here. You know, they don't, they don't do that. Um, this is the way it's going to go from here to here. You know, the disciples didn't run ahead to each city and say, hey, Jesus is coming into town. He's kind of a big deal, you know? So let's shut down the streets, all right, from this time, and here's how he's going to get to where he's going. Uh, that's not what happened. This is a, this is a, basically, the way I understand it, uh, word was getting out and about what Jesus had just done to the, the, the beggar, and the people said, hey, Jesus, yeah, he's in the street now, and people were running out, oh, we want to see him, we want to see him, and Zacchaeus was one of those people, but once again, I want to point out to you that Zacchaeus did not give up, he didn't say, oh, man, why do I have to be so small of stature? Oh well. He went to extreme lengths. Imagine, just think in your mind for a moment, of one of the, the richest people that you know. Not, maybe not even personally. Maybe you just read about them. You just know that they're rich. And imagine them putting themselves in a position where someone comes to town and like, man, i got to see him. And so they go and they climb up in a tree and sit there. Can you imagine any... I, that, I mean, here again, I'm stereotyping, I recognize that. But sometimes when you hear enough, oh, they're the, they're the top ten richest people in the United States, your head starts to go, you ain't climbing a tree to see anybody. They should be climbing trees to see you, right? Uh, well, here's Zacchaeus, and he wants to see Jesus so bad that he knew he would have to go by whatever street, he knew the route he was going to take, and he ran ahead, right, where the crowd was thinner, and he went, and he knew, hey, when Jesus gets near, people are just going to push me out of the way again, I'm not going to be able to see, so here's a sycamore tree, I'm going to go ahead and climb up it, all right, because he wanted to see Jesus. He knew Jesus was coming that way, and the only way I'm going to see who this man is is if I give myself some, some height. I get up in this tree. So just the humility that he was willing to put himself in, just glimpse Jesus. He wasn't expecting an autograph. All he was going to do, all he knew is Jesus is coming this way. I need to see him. And so what should have happened is Jesus should have just walked on by, and again, I don't know what he was doing, if people were, I don't know. But um People, I'm sure, were pressing on him. That's what happened. And as he's as he's making his way down the street, Jesus probably would be so focused on getting through the crowd, he wouldn't even notice the guy in the tree. I mean, maybe just a little, oh, there's a guy in that tree there? Oh, okay, whatever. Uh, but that's not what happened. Which reminds me of what a marvelous Savior we have. Because, look, when things are flying at you, our brain goes, Whoa! All right, we, have, we try to put it all together. But Jesus, again, these crowds that are there, all of these people, and as he passed by, there's Zacchaeus. See, I have to talk to him. The, the knowledge, the all-knowingness of God. So, Zacchaeus runs ahead, he climbs up in the tree, we know all that. Uh, because he, he knew Jesus was going to go by that tree. Verse 5, so here comes Jesus. Right, he's walking. It says that when he came to the place, that's that tree. When he came to that tree, he looked up and he saw Zacchaeus. And he kept on, well, he gave him kind of a nod and kept on walking by. And Zacchaeus felt so special because oh, Jesus looked at me and he nodded to me. That's not what happened, did it? I have never been um, 
I have never been at a place where people crowd me and I have that bodyguard push people out of the way to go to my car. Have any of you ever experienced that? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, but I guarantee you, I'm going to be focused. If, if, I'm, if I'm coming out of church today and suddenly all of Croton is there and they're like storming me, oh, break it in, break it in, oh! I'm not going to be focused on, my focus is going to be, I'm going to get to my vehicle. All right? Um, and yet here we have Jesus. All of these crowds, and his brain wasn't going, oh no, there's so many people here. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? He wasn't thinking, I'm going to get out of this city. Um, I don't know what I don't know what he was doing on his way. I don't know if he stopped and talked to other people. I don't know any of that. We don't need to know any of that. Maybe someday we will. But what I do know is this man was up in that tree, and Jesus, when he came to that point, um, I'm, it doesn't say he stopped, but I mean he at least slowed down and he looked up. He didn't look up because of like hey, there's a guy in a tree. He looked up because he knew Zacchaeus was there. He had some instructions for Zacchaeus. And he looked up, he saw Zacchaeus, and listened to what he said. Zacchaeus, make haste. Or Zacchaeus, quickly, get out of that tree. Come down. For I'm going to your house today. All right. uh, when I was young, I used to think when we sang Zacchaeus, I used to think it was, for I'm going to your house for tea. I don't know, maybe they did have tea, but uh, that's not what it says here. Uh, it says, for today, I must abide at thy house. That is pretty amazing privilege. Once again, here's Jesus. There were enough people there that would have died just to spend some intimate time with him, some time alone with him. And Jesus comes, and once again, need I remind you, this tax collector, a sinner of sinners, he says, Zacchaeus, quickly get down from that tree, because I, I, today I must go to your house. This word must, Jesus isn't saying, Zacchaeus, can I come to your house for a little bit? Jesus is saying this, I am coming to your house. I am. This was not a random encounter. This is the amazing sovereignty of God. But he stopped here and he singled out a line, uh, uh, what is his name, Zacchaeus. Um, again, imagine this. He has a crowd of people and he looks at you. We went, um, when we were in Wisconsin once, uh, let me think, I'm not going to remember his name, Donald Driver, I believe, came, came to Walmart there. And, uh, you know, so we got in line, got something signed. He doesn't remember me. Uh, I mean, we weren't in line. He said, you, you get up here right now and sit with me. He said, today, we're going to McDonald's. He didn't say that. Yeah, he said a few words, very nice. So, hey, how are you guys doing? Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay, thanks. All right? Um, here, Jesus looks at him and says, hey, Zacchaeus, thanks for coming, buddy. He says, get down from that tree. Quickly. I am going to your house today. We're not scheduling it. You don't call my guy and we'll schedule an appointment. Right now, today, that's where I'm headed. That's another thing. This is where I am on this street to go to your house, Zacchaeus. Wow. Listen, here's the, here's the thing. One of the things that I think we can learn from this. We talk about the gospel today. How Jesus died for the sins of the world. I know that's great to know. But ultimately what you need to understand is that Jesus died for you. We need to feel like Zacchaeus where... Where, where when, whenever we read Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love toward you. And while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. And if you want to have eternal life, you have to believe that 
Jesus Christ died for your sins, he was buried and rose again. This amazing opportunity that Zacchaeus was given there, I'm going to say our personal trust in Jesus Christ is no less important. When we have, and I'm going to use some weird words, maybe some words here, but when we, when we encounter our sinfulness, our, our need of a Savior, that's what we need to feel. But Christ died for me. It's like the fingers pointing at us, not in condemnation, but you. I love you. My son died for you. Trust in me. Today, don't wait. Quickly, right now. Trust in me. And our personal encounter is no less marvelous and amazing. We don't have to climb up in a tree uh, to get it. That offer has gone out right now today to all. But we can't be like Zacchaeus and say, eh. Uh, too much. Or, uh, I have enough. That's not what exactly he's because I'm rich. I don't, what do I need Jesus for? We have to be able to set ourselves aside and know that we need that message of grace. We need to trust in what God has done for me through his son Jesus. Zacchaeus made haste, verse 6 says. He came down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus was given a word to obey, and he did it right away. And not just a word. I had plans for today. I was going to take my boat out on the Dead Sea, but he doesn't do that. He, he welcomes Jesus joyfully. Once again, I can, make, uh, I can make ties to salvation. And this is what the gospel goes out. Jesus Christ died for your sin. He was buried. He rose again. Trust in that and be saved. And then it comes down to a choice. Either stay up in that tree. Or we get down and joyfully. Yes! How could I not? But believe fully that salvation comes through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Please understand, I'm making, an, I'm making a, 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 I'm using this as an illustration here. It's not what, I mean, uh, back in chapter 18, Jesus is trying to tell the disciples about his death, burial, and resurrection. And basically, uh, a simplified uh, summary of what they, they thought was, huh? All right, so that's not what, that's not all exactly has had to believe here, right? right? But we, that's our message that we have to believe. Zacchaeus obeyed. Verse 7. Uh, when they saw it, listen to this. This is religion. This is this is so much of Christendom, unfortunately. We love our little, we love our yes people. Everyone that agrees with us. Let's just get together with everyone that agrees with us. And just that's all we get to, that's all we talk to. You can't evangelize the people that have already been evangelized. I think I just made up a word. In order to share the gospel with people, you have to reach out to the unsaved. Jesus wasn't concerned with what everyone thought of him. Once again, this is a tax collector. You wouldn't be caught dead in the home of a tax collector. Didn't happen. And anybody that did knock on Zacchaeus' door. Let's say you had to knock on Zacchaeus' door because his dog was barking too loud. He kept you up all night. Uh, guess what? The neighborhood was talking. <gasps> Did you see? I wonder if they're friends. They're probably in on it together, aren't they? Oh, boy. You didn't do that. You stayed away from them. They were anathema. And here, Jesus, in front of everybody, he didn't go up in the tree and say, this is Zacchaeus. Come on. Sneak down. I'm going to meet you at your house. Let me in the back door. For everyone to hear, he said, Zacchaeus, Quickly, get down from the tree because I am going to your house today. What do the other Christians do? Christians. The Pharisees, the religious people, the Jews in charge do. <gasps> How dare he? Did 
Did you hear what Jesus is doing? He's gone to that sinner's house. Not just a sinner, a tax collector. The guest is a man that is a sinner. I guarantee you, Jesus didn't go to Zacchaeus' house to sin with him. Another, another time when, um, when the Pharisees, oh, he's eating with publicans and whatever else they were. Uh, Jesus' response to them was, well, this is my paraphrase, maybe I shouldn't paraphrase, but um, that he was the great physician. And he was there to heal those that need healing. In other words, let me, let me use the Pauline verse for you. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Quite honestly, if we or people are going to have uh, a response like verse 7, um, shame on us. Because what that does is it cheapens the need to evangelize. Once again, because I think we think, oh no, Jesus, we need to understand what Jesus is doing here. He was not going there. Zacchaeus, I'm going to get quickly, let's go to your house, because man, I, have, I, I need to sin. He was going there to share with Zacchaeus how to be liberated from sin. Zacchaeus wouldn't have heard that if Jesus wouldn't have looked up in that tree and said, you. Each of you here, if you're saved, it's because God didn't say, oh boy, not them. They are not going to be part of my eternity. I don't want them in one of my churches. But because God said, you, my son died for you. Come to me through trusting in him. Praise the Lord that Jesus didn't care what some people in that crowd thought. He knew Zacchaeus needed him. So he went to his house. Uh, and uh, verse uh, 8, Zacchaeus stood, said unto the Lord, saying, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore it fourfold. Um, Zacchaeus was willing to, uh, uh, to, to not just uh, adhere to the law, but go above and beyond it. He was going to take his, his riches and give it to those in need. And not only that, but he was going to, if there was someone that he cheated, he was going to give them what he cheated them out of times four. So, so uh, Zacchaeus was doing what was required for entrance into the kingdom that Jesus was preaching here. Um, and so we see the, the heart of of here. Uh, Zacchaeus changed the fact that Jesus was willing to say Zacchaeus I'm going to your house it took Zacchaeus' life and it changed dramatically not just his life and his heart but his, his, his lifestyle and now all those beggars that sat out outside of Jer Jericho just wanting just please a little bit Zacchaeus was not going to just be influence his own personal space but he was going to influence Others, because Jesus Christ changed his life. Now, um, look at verses 9 and 10. Jesus said unto them, This day is salvation came to this house. For, for so much as he can't... Has, oh boy, I'm trying to hurry now. So I'm looking at the clock. Take a deep breath. For so much as he also is the son of Abraham. I've heard uh, that um, Zacchaeus was a Gentile, all those things. No, he wasn't. He was, a, he was a Jew. Listen to this, verse 10. Why was Jesus in Zacharias, Zacchaeus' house? Because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Turn back to, uh, to two passages. Luke chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. 
So chapter 3, verse 12, it says, and then listen to this. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed unto you. So, this already in Jesus' ministry, tax collectors had been coming to Jesus to, to I believe this is John, let me make sure. No, uh, anyway, had been coming to be uh, baptized and, um, and, uh, and already the answer was, no, you get out of here. But this is what you need to do. If you've stolen, make restitution. And so what we have in uh, Luke chapter 19 is a personal account of what, of what Jesus had been telling them right here in Luke chapter 3. Uh, he didn't start saving tax collectors in Luke chapter 19. Uh, if they came to him, he gave them uh, the, the answer. Uh, one more passage, Luke chapter 18, and you're going to have to uh, just maybe look into these a little bit more later if you want to, uh, even if you don't want to. Um, and uh, this is a parable in Luke chapter 18, uh, and uh, guess what chapter comes after chapter 18? Chapter 19, the one we were just in, right? So here's a parable, and what I'm, go I'm already going to tell you is my point in turning here. Jesus tells a parable, and it's about a religious person, a Pharisee, and it's about a tax collector. Alright? And so he gives this parable, and guess what happens in Luke chapter 19? The parable had a real life application. Alright? So again, you're going to have to make these ties later. I'm just going to read them. Luke chapter 19, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. You ready? And Jesus spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. That they were righteous and despised others. Oh man, if that, if that doesn't fit with what was happening with Zacchaeus, I don't know what does. Anyway, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One man was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, idolaters, or even as this publican right here. I don't I got that accent, but um, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Okay, yeah, I guess. Then we have this tax collector who was standing far off. He would, he was, he wouldn't even lift up his eyes because he was un, thought he was unworthy unto heaven. But he smote on his breast and he said, "God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner." Here's the moral of the story. I tell you that this tax collector went down to his house justified instead of the other one, the, the Pharisee, for everyone that exalts himself shall be humbled, and everyone that humbles himself shall be exalted. Here's the lesson. This is, this is what happened in Luke chapter 19 with the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who as far as society was concerned, should have thought, I am important, and Jesus should be coming to see me. Humbled himself and says, no, I have to see you. And here's my lesson for today. Religion tries to puff you up. Look how good you are. Look what you've done. Look what you belong to. There are so many self-righteous people out in the world that say, I don't need a God, or I'm good enough, or, but also in churches, in religion, in the consistency throughout Scripture, in Jesus' teaching, whether it's in the Proverbs, whether it's in the Gospel, whether it's in grace, is you need to get your boasting in the Lord. Because He's the only one worth boasting. In conclusion, today, I'm looking out here, all of you are here, and I hope this is true of all of you. I pray all of it is of all of you, but I don't even know who's watching or will watch. Today, don't be so proud that you think I'm good enough, I'm right enough, I'm fine, I believe in God, I'm okay. Because all of us, all of us sitting here, all of us standing right here, all of you watching to wherever you are, all of us fall short of the glory of God. And yet God has
has said, I sent my son for you. You trust in him and be saved today. And you will have eternal life. Do not let self-righteousness and pride keep you out of heaven. Because Jesus Christ wants you to trust in his work. So that you can have eternally with that marvelous Savior. Let's pray. God, Father, thank you. But what a marvelous Savior. And we even see it here in this Gospel of Luke. What a marvelous thing to do. Jesus, knowing Zacchaeus. And looking up to him and said, Zacchaeus, I'm going with you. Get down with me. And then the reminder that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost. And, and Father, those of us who rightly divide, we understand he was lost. It was the nation that Jesus came to call back to himself. We get that. And yet, Father, it's no less true that today it is stated Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, and that's why we have your grace today, because God wants those without him to trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that they're no longer in condemnation, but have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Father, if there is one here today, if there's one who watching now or later who has never trusted in Jesus Christ, Father, work on their heart. Let them see that the only answer is to trust fully in what Jesus Christ has done, that he died on the cross for their sins. He was buried and rose again. And Father, we sang a song today. We sang three songs today, near the cross, all of that. But Father, we sung about a marvelous, or what a wonderful Savior. Father, I pray that that song isn't just something that came out of our mouth. That it's what our heart is singing. Help open our eyes so that we can see what a wonderful Savior we have in Jesus Christ. That he was willing to come to this earth for me. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ.